All right, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce James Kellerman. He's a VP of Engineering for Thetis Corporation in Portland. Today he is asking, in a world built of software, who controls your experience? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm not used to talking with a microphone, so it's going to take me a little bit of time just to get levels um, and pace. Uh, if you can't hear me, or if I start talking really fast in a strange accent, um, well, strange accent is just going to be me. Um, if I talk really fast, just someone yell at me to slow me down. So, um, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, particular thanks to uh, Jason Gilbraith and uh, Cody Gear for uh, inviting me. Uh, and the PSEP program through PSU uh, for reaching out to Thetis. Um, today I'm going to talk about how software is taking on more and more uh, duties, uh, taking on more and more tasks that we traditionally thought of as human tasks and uh, tasks of the mind. Uh, there's also a lot of potential unintended consequences from this, um, and I'll kind of express some of those as we go through. Uh, this talk might sound a little dystopian at times. Uh, I'm actually super pro technology. I love being a part of the industry, but there are lots of uh, issues associated with it. So the first thing I want to do is start with a quote from uh, William Gibson. Uh, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Um, and by this, we can see the technologies that we have today. Um, and we can see the difference between us and other countries and other um, peoples in terms of access to technology, but we also have labs and research facilities which have a totally different level of technology in them and that will only come to us over the next few years. Um, so many of the things we're talking about here have already been invented, already exist, already work in labs, um, but have yet to be distributed evenly to everybody else. So just some uh, paradigms. Computers are everywhere and in everything. Um, I was born in 1974 and I had my first job in 1996 and computers were pretty omnipresent. But today they are everywhere, in everything. We have fridges that are computers that keep food cool. We have um, phones that are computers that occasionally make phone calls. And uh, we have just about everything else with a computer embedded in. Uh, we're constantly improving. We're really only just starting out on this path. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and this can have profound social uh, effects. So what are computers? Uh, more fundamentally, uh, they are mechanical minds in the same way that tools are mechanical muscles. Um, we can look back at the Industrial Revolution effectively the last 200, 250 years and see that these mechanical muscles have enabled us to do incredible things. Um, mine, fly to space, you, know, you name it, we've done it through mechanical muscles. And it's made our lives enormously better as a consequence. We don't have to do lots of hard physical labor. Um, we can have uh, uh, stuff delivered to our house. We can do just about anything through these mechanical muscles. And now we're entering the era of the mechanical mind. Um, it might look like we've been on this path for a long time, but really computers have only started taking on these tasks in the last 30 years or so. Um, and to illustrate that, I want to go back to my first career, which was in uh, automotive engineering. I joined Ford Motor Company in about 1996, and my job was to program these things, which are pretty boring to look at. And uh, this thing is an engine controls module, and it was attached to one of these which drove one of these, and uh, my job was to make this thing drive as well as possible using software. And at the time, software did a few tasks on the car that previously humans had done. Uh, we had anti-lock brakes. This was a task that, in the past, people had to learn how to do. You had to modulate your pressure on the brake pedal in order to not skid and crash your car. But as soon as software got good enough to do it, we took the human out of the loop and just said, let's let the computer do this thing. Um, and the same started to apply to more and more pieces throughout the car. Um, fuel injection, we couldn't do it mechanically well enough, so we had software do it. Um, traction control, drivers aren't very good, they skid, they can't steer properly. Um, we introduced traction control and stability control, so the software could do a better job of it than people. And we saw this throughout the technology stack on the car. But in 1996, the car was still fundamentally the same as this. Um, it still had a steering wheel, 
it still had pedals, you operated it in the same way, and your experience of the vehicle was essentially the same thing. Um, if you wanted to go somewhere, you had to get in this thing, concentrate, turn the wheel, learn the rules of the road and obey them, interact with other drivers, um, and you had to learn these skills, which took quite a long time. Now, we fast forward a little bit to cars of today, where we see computers doing all of these things. Um, and these are all little tasks that, in the past, humans did. Um, parking systems. Uh, has anybody seen an automated parking system working? It's kind of cool. You drive up the space, get out of the car, push the button, and the car parks itself. Uh, no one has to learn how to parallel park anymore, which would be lovely. Um, but uh, these are happening all over the car. But they're really still just abstracting away um, tasks that we did. The next step changes things altogether, and this is where software really starts to play a role. Self-driving cars are transformational in lots of ways. Um, and those ways are both good and bad. The major difference is it's shifted the experience completely. You're no longer directly in control of your experience. In the past, you had the steering wheel, the brake pedals, accelerator. You were largely in control of the outcome of your journey. <laughs> it's so weird not being able to see anybody. Um, uh, so you were largely in control of your experience. But with self-driving cars, all of a sudden we're saying, we're going to give up that control. We're going to hand over that control to a software agent to do the task, because quite honestly, it does it better than us. Um, and these aren't future technologies. They exist. Um, they've already driven hundreds of thousands of miles all over the US. Um, they've raced up mountains uh, with Audi. Um, and they're going to have some profound impacts on uh, our society. Um, they'll have good impacts. They're a lot safer. Um, right now, well, this is 2013 statistics. Uh, people killed 32,700 people in cars in the US alone and 1.3 million worldwide. Robots kill none um, and are likely to kill very, very few. Um, they're much, much, much safer. Uh, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be better. And it turns out we're not very good at these things, um, and computers are. Inevitably, they'll start taking on these roles. Computers start off by doing the stuff that we find hard to do and fiddly and progress up to taking more and more of the tasks from us. Um, so good, they're going to be safer, more efficient. We're going to get to our journeys faster. But the question is, what are the, what are the downsides? Well, there are currently 3.5 million people employed in transportation jobs. People don't want robots and people. They like robots, well, companies like robots because they're cheap, easy, reliable, and safe. Um, so now we have 3.5 million people who need to do something else, uh, and we don't know what. And automation has this effect in lots of places. I pick cars because it's one of the areas that I have a lot of expertise in. Um, so what are the other issues here? As with lots of software issues, we have privacy, control, and responsibility concerns. And what I'd like to point out, these aren't engineering problems alone. Um, a lot of computer science and a lot of engineering is all about how do we solve a problem. But now we have to ask ourselves, um, what is the problem we want to solve, and how do we solve it, uh, to do it in the right way? So there are privacy issues, there are control issues, and there are responsibility issues with automation. Um, privacy issues are already at the forefront of a lot of things. Uh, we can see that in social media, we see that through phone tracking, through the NSA work. But we're starting to give away a lot of privacy for, and a lot of control in order to have this convenience. And that's fine. That may be a very reasonable compromise to make. Uh, but we need to be conscious of it and choose the parameters with which we give those control away. Um, what information are we prepared to give in, response, in return for what? Um, and the control issue is a really interesting one because <sighs> there is a very old scam, a uh, very old tourist scam uh, that I could illustrate this with. Um, when you travel around the world and you get taxis in strange places, uh, often there is a carpet scam or other my cousin's shop scam where you get a very cheap taxi ride, it just doesn't go exactly where you wanted it to. Um, you get in the cab, you negotiate a price, and the guy goes, yep, no problem, I'll take you there. But first we have to stop at my friend's store. It's the best store in town. You're going to love his stuff. Um, 
yeah, but I'm not able to get to where I want to go. Yeah, okay. When you're in the car, you're kind of going there, you have a little choice in the matter. Um, and that scam is pretty commonplace. But we could see that easily being taken into a technical future where you don't want to get your, it knows you're a Timbers fan, you want to go somewhere, do you want to stop by the Timbers store? Eh, not really. Well, that'll be an extra dollar um, just to avoid that uh, pit stop. Um, who is ultimately in control of your journey? Who is in control of where you go and how you do it? Um, these are all questions that need to be asked and aren't necessarily technical in nature. They're more about how we want our society to behave. All right, so cars. They're a small part of our life. Um, I don't know how many people here drive. I can't even see. I got a couple, several. All right. Who here thinks their kids are ever going to drive a car? I'm getting very few, probably. Um, yeah, I think it's very likely that we'll look back in 20 or 30 years' time and think, holy God, we let people drive cars. They killed loads of people. That was super dangerous. Why did we let them do that? Um, but we won't feel that way until we no longer do. Um, so what about other automation? Well, automation applies in lots of places. Software, this is a general purpose um, tool, and we can apply it to everything, and it's being applied to everything. We're only really just starting to apply it to everything. Um, and one of the areas that's being applied to is the media. Um, and this works in several ways. There are um, bot-written stories. Uh, you've probably read one. Uh, most of the major news outlets use bots to consolidate and write um, basic stories. But there's also the problem of which stories you see. Um, and I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but about a year ago, there was a major uh, palaver over Facebook manipulating the feeds of, their, of people to see their response. And they changed the number of positive things and the number of negative things you saw in your feed. And they wanted to see what the impact was on their users, whether they would write more, whether they would write about positive things or sad things. And it turns out when you show people sad stuff, it makes them sad. And when you show people happy stuff, it makes them happy. And this raised a bunch of ethical concerns because no one knew they were being manipulated. <clears throat> no one had expected for Facebook to try and make them happy or sad as a result of an algorithm. Um, and along the same lines, there was a study done in 2012 um, about political preferences and search algorithms. So here is a software agent that has a goal. It may not be aligned with your goal. And its goal in this case is to change your political preference. And it does so by modifying where search results appear in the ranking, and that only. So you're searching for a political candidate, and it puts positive search results higher up in the ranking versus lower in the ranking. And the problem here is that we aren't aware of it. There's no transparency about what these algorithms, what this automation, and what these uh, software bots are ultimately trying to do. They may appear to be acting in our interest, but they're actually acting for somebody. And they could be doing something really good. Um, as you say, they can save hundreds of lives. Uh, doctor bots are likely to save thousands of people through uh, improved diagnosis and improved uh, surgical outcomes. But not all of these outcomes are good. And one of the questions we have to ask ourselves, especially as we enter into the society, just as we did in the Industrial Revolution, is what do we want to put these tools to use to do? What is it that we are trying to achieve with them? It is no good just building them. We are trying to achieve some outcome. Uh, in the automotive industry, we are trying to say, I want to get from point A to point B as safely and easily as possible, and I will trade off control and ownership of the vehicle uh, for that. Um, but it's not clear in every industry, in every area of uh, our society as to how we want to do that and what automation we're prepared to accept. Yeah, this is a bit more depressing than I'd expected. Um, so there are risks associated with this. Um, many of those risks can be helped through transparency. So we need to know what the internals of these systems are and what they are intended to do. What are the goals of that system? Are those goals fundamentally aligned with our goals? And whilst they are, that's great. That's exactly what we want to happen. We want technologies to help us solve our problems, um, and we do so when it's aligned with the corporate or software bot's objective. Um, but as they take on more complex tasks, there are complex and potentially unintended consequences that come from them. So a couple of questions that we have to ask ourselves. Um, 
Let's go back again briefly to automotive. Um, who's responsible when a software car crashes? Is it the driver any longer? Um, is it the company that wrote the software? Is it some sensor beside the roadside that failed to do its duty? Um, we've yet to even tackle these issues of responsibility. We haven't got legal frameworks for them. Um, we haven't had social frameworks. We haven't had the discussion yet, really, about how we expect these things to work and interact with us as people. Um, we're going to end up building systems. These systems are encoded in the goals of the software. Um, and if we're not very careful, some of those systems may not be to our advantage. Um, it may be to the advantage of the controlling company, maybe to the advantage of the state. You know, we need to direct it to make a positive advantage for us. Um, so responsibility, who's responsible? Um, who has access to the information that these systems generate? Um, what can they do with that information? Uh, who can they share it with? Um, and fundamentally, who does the software really work for? Now, again, I'm going to kind of ask a question, but who's used a robot recently? Has anyone used a supermarket checkout robot? Or an ATM robot? Um, there are plenty of examples of this kind of automation happening all over the place that don't look like what we expect it to look like. They're not machines picking stuff up on factory lines. They're just one checkout stand now with 12 robots that uh, specialize in handling grocery checkout and one guy or woman uh, managing that line. Uh, so we're starting to see this automation appear in all sorts of places. Um, and it's all driven by largely the same factors, uh, economic. So what would I want you to take away from this? Um, apart from the fact that automation is coming and people are looking for ways to automate absolutely every task that they can. Um, the fact that the computers are everywhere and in everything is great. It's going to provide us a rich set of data to make decisions upon. But it also asks us questions about how we want to use that. Um, computers and algorithms can act for you or against you, but we may not know the rules by which they are playing. Um, we're just getting started. Many of these questions are still in vigorous debate. There are significant consequences to automation, both good and bad. I'd like to say cars basically created the structure of our urban world. Our roads and sidewalks, our pavements, our um, gap parking structures are all a co consequence of the car, all a consequence of needing to get from A to B. When we change that, we also change the structure of our cities. I would argue that the implementation of automation and the industrial revolution of software that we are going through has the potential to change our society in the same way that cars change the urban environment. Uh, we will change things in order to accommodate them as part of our lives because they make things easier and better. Um, like I said, these are not engineering problems. These are social problems. These are questions we have to ask ourselves about how we want the world to work and when we can automate it. Right now, we're limited in the number of decisions we can make. We're limited, um, and a good example here might be uh, an ethics question around uh, a car crash. So right now, we're very limited in our ability to change outcomes. So if we're in a car and we skid out of control, we basically just crash into the barriers or whatever happens. But a robot can make decisions during that time because it has the opportunity to do so. So for example, it can crash your car and in a slightly more dangerous way for you, but save other lives. It could avoid the school bus, but hit the barrier. Um, and we need to encode those rules into our systems. And we need to have transparency around those rules because they become the structure uh, once that structure is established, it's very difficult to change it. So there is tremendous hope from automation. It will change our world. Software is going to be a part of everything. And every job will touch software somehow. But the really deep questions are probably more social and ethical ones than they are about technology. We will solve the technical problems. We will build faster computers. We will uh, make better sensors and better actuators. Um, we know how to do all of those things. What we haven't really done is figured out how we want to use those to achieve what ends. Um, so uh, I realize this is kind of uh, uh, dark in a way. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on this. Uh, I have a bunch of further reading and information if people are interested in following up on that. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I think that's right. 
Uh, okay, so I was just wondering, uh, what are like steps that we can take to, you know, protect ourselves from these dangers of uh -huh. automation? What what can we do to prevent that? So the sad answer is very little. Um, the the power that is driving automation is an economic one. Um, Computers are much, much cheaper to do the same thing than we are. And it's likely, it's lovely to think that we're really small, intelligent flowers and that computers can't do that. But every task we've set them so far, uh, turns out once they've done it, we find ways to say that task wasn't desperately special in the first place. Um, a nice example of this is chess. Um, chess used to be regarded as a problem that only AIs could solve. We need an AI, we need a general purpose intelligence to beat a great chess grandmaster. But it turned out you didn't need that. You needed a powerful computer, there was a limited set of openings, a limited set of closings, and a statistically uh, solvable mid-game. And once we solved it, everyone's like, oh, it's not an AI problem. And it turns out lots and lots of problems aren't AI problems. They're just more complex than we had tools to solve at the time. Um, I think that this is ultimately a political um, problem. It's something that we need to do at the companies that we're at and guide them to be ethical because there are moral hazards that will entice us to do things that aren't. Um, I'm very curious, for example, at Google, how they avoid the hazard of modifying search results to make them look better. Wouldn't it be tempting if you ran the world's information engine to say, we're just going to boost positive results results about the company by a few percent. We don't have the transparency to know whether that's the case or not. And those are the sorts of things where we see social good, where we see overlap with the public sphere, that we need to demand that kind of transparency to, to better understand it. Uh, so there's definitely going to be like a lot of like we're going to have to take a lot of leaps to be able to get to a point where automation is like life. Um, how, how do you suppose we'll get society to like to adjust to like maybe new legislations that might seem like bad for them right away like maybe mandating uh, automated vehicles? Hmm. Uh, it's a good question. Um, so just to the first part, it's already here. Automation is already here, um, and in quite wide scale. Uh, it's only going to get better from here. And yes, there are some, there are some technical challenges to overcome, but I've, it, in labs all over the world, there are roadmaps to achieve it. There are no big unknowns here. Um, we pretty much know how to do it. Um, and I think it's probably going to move faster than our social response to it will. And I imagine that that will create some tensions. Uh, I think the best thing we can do is prepare ourselves through education, through inquiry, through uh, politics, and through holding companies in particular accountable. It's very easy to use these products and not, uh, and not be concerned about the impact of it. We all use cell phones. I do this too. I don't want to say I am totally a part of this system. I'm not uh, in any way like outside of it. I'm very much a part of this. I carry a cell phone with me everywhere I go. It has all of my location data. I do a bunch of self-tracking on top of it. Um, it already is here. We just haven't yet dealt with the consequences of it. And I think uh, partly that's about engaging with organizations. That's about having that uh, political discourse around that, and what level of control uh, governments need to exert to bring these things in regulatory compliance. There's a whole legal and ethical framework that doesn't exist. Thank you. Cheers,